मुक्तकृतिर भावते स्वयं लिख्यते कृतम् हृदय हुहरमे कवल ब्रह्म व्यगमहमी साक्षात आत्मेण भातिमनसास्व चिन्नतावन चल निरोद आत्मनिष्ठो देहमृमयवज्जात्मक अहम बुद्धिर्न तस्तु नाहम तत्तभेत सुप्ति सदभावत कोहम भावयुत कुत वरधीय दृष्टात्मनिष्टात्म सोहम स्फूर्तिदयारुणा चल शिव पूर्ण विभा स्वयं सोहम स्फूर्तिदयारुणा चल शिव अरुणाचल शिव पूर्ण विभा गुड ईवनिंग एवरी वन एंड वेलकम टू द रमणा सत्संग एंड नमस्कार Adi Shankara Charya in Viveka Chudamani begins by observing that it is hard to attain human birth and that having attained it one should strive to achieve the bliss of liberation by jnana alone is this bliss to be obtained and jnana is achieved only through vichara or steady inquiry in order to learn this method of inquiry Shankara says one should see the grace of the guru our guru bhagwan maharamana set forth that the direct path to liberation is self inquiry today the topic for satsang is vedantic self inquiry we have here with us swami sarvapriyananda from vedantic society of new york who is very very well known throughout the world for his lectures on advaita philosophy he and here he comes from the esteemed traditions of ramakrishna math which is firmly established in the teachings of sri ramakrishna and swami vivekananda as earnest seekers of truth we are very fortunate to be part of this satsang to listen to his lecture on self inquiry and learn from him I want to cover a few logistics on this we will start with swami's lecture and after the lecture we will have a chanting of uh, bhagwan's upadesha saram and then we will follow that with the aarti after the aarti we will have the prasad and the dinner and that is arranged in the other room and uh, since uh, most of the chairs are placed here Whoever wants a chair, if you can carry your chairs to the other room and and take it for dinner, that will be appreciated. And the restroom is this side. For those of you who have not come here before, the restroom is on the left side, so you can use that. And uh, 
प्लीज डू स्टे फॉर द सत्संग एंड थ्रू द डिनर एंड वी आर ऑल वेरी वेरी हैप्पी टू सी यू ऑल एंड वी कान हैव अ बेटर एकेशन दैन दिस टू प्रैक्टिस सेल्फ इंक्वायरी एंड लर्न सेल्फ इंक्वायरी फ्रॉम श्री स्वामी सर्वप्रियानंद एंड नाउ अब नमस्कार टू यू स्वामी एंड विदाउट फर्दर अडू I humbly request you to start your lecture. Is it okay if I stand up to speak? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Stand up to speak. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Please. At the back. Yes. Can you hear me? Om Asato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityur Ma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Good evening and namaste, everybody. I am very grateful uh, for all of you that you have turned up for this program on this rainy evening. I'm particularly grateful to <coughs> Rama and Shiv and Arvind and Surya for. inviting me into their beautiful home for this program um i sort of happened to be in your neighborhood this year uh, harvard university they have a special program for hindu monastics which they have started this year so it's a one year fellowship so i'm i'm there at the divinity school and i'm on my way back to back to school uh, in the train there are a lot of kids i mean uh, college undergrads they are all going back to back to college because the spring semester is starting um and i was thinking i'm part of that gang too now <laughs> <laughs> at harvard at the philosophy department a professor of philosophy asked me this question he said swami the goal of spiritual life is enlightenment right uh, moksha nirvana salvation whatever you call it god realization but that's so rare so very few people don't you agree that so very few people in any generation will get it So if it's that rare, only very few will ever get it. Then why start that at all? Why do such a thing, which which chances of success are so low? What answer will you give if somebody asks you this question? So I gave him two answers, and he gave me a third answer. So those three answers I will share with you. Why spiritual life? If chances of success are very low, I mean, becoming a Vivekananda or a Ramana or Buddha is very low. Then why at all pursue it? three reasons uh, answers which i gave were first everybody will get enlightenment because our real nature is brahman is that absolute at least that's what advaita says you and that ultimate reality are one reality because it is divinity is our own nature how can we not get it one day or the other we will have it nothing can stop us so enlightenment is inevitable Yes, it's true. In any generation, very few might get it, but each of us, ultimately, of course, the catch word is ultimately this life or next life or some life, we'll get it someday. So it's it it is there. It's not that we'll. That's this is one thing where you cannot fail. Definitely, you'll get it. Krishna also says that in the Bhagavad Gita, when Arjuna asks him that if I pursue this path um, and I don't realize God in this life, so is it wasted? Sixth chapter, and Krishna says anybody who sets out on this path. of spiritual seeking what's the path the path of spiritual seeking uh, never comes to a bad end nahi durgatim data kashchit kashchiti never comes to a bad end on this path always this path is always uh, fruitful so that's one answer ultimately we will all get enlightenment surely there's no doubt about it second answer is that what else will you do once you begin to get a taste of this path once you begin to feel it this becomes the most important thing in your life it grows on you until it becomes the central thing in your life when i was coming in the car today rama was saying that it has become the most important thing in my life um what else will you do what else is as important as this everything else continues family and job and your personal life your personal quest everything continues but the center of our life becomes the spiritual quest so that's the second answer i gave what else will you do if you don't pursue god realization enlightenment in fact 
until somebody is a spiritual seeker of whatever sort, whatever path you follow. I'm not saying that self-enquiry which we'll talk about today is the only path, no. There are other paths too. But in some path you are on this journey, then only I consider you, I personally consider you to be mature. Till that point you are still you know, trying out the world. So this is the second reason I gave. What else will you do? This is the most important thing in life. The professor said to me, Swami, these two are good answers, but they are you know, philosophical, abstract. I'll give you a third answer. Why one should pursue the spiritual life? And he gave a beautiful answer, which I'll share with you. Third reason, why should you be spiritual? Why should you path, follow this path? Uh, he said, once you start following it, whatever happens in the future, you get enlightenment, God realization, that's a different thing. But the benefits start flowing to you day by day. The more you pursue this, more you pray and meditate and worship and, and do vichara inquiry, the more peace you get, the more strength you get. Um, the benefits are so obvious and those benefits are not future benefits, day to day. That this itself sustains people. It becomes a source of peace and joy. That's why you should be on this path. I thought that was a beautiful answer. So three answers. First, you will get enlightenment. No doubt about it. Don't be afraid about that. Surely, all of us will. Second, this is the most important thing in life. What else will you do? Third, it gives benefits. Well before getting enlightenment, on the journey, you keep getting the benefit day by day with every little bit of practice. Again, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Swalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat. Even a little practice in spiritual life, even a little bit of it, saves you from great fear and anxiety and, uh, and unhappiness. So, among all the paths, self-inquiry is, uh, is the one which was stressed by Bhagavan Ramana. The, he is identified with this. Bhagavan Ramana and who am I? They go together. It is not that Bhagavan Ramana was against any of the other paths. We are, there are enough records to show that he encouraged people in, in what was suited to different temperaments. But he would always bring it back to this point. So there's this, uh, it's not that he was against bhakti. For example, his devotion to Arunachala Shiva is very well known. A very deep devotion. So one gentleman came to him um, saying that, you know, I am not all that interested in your who am I, it seems too dry and I love my Narayana. Lord Narayana, I love my Narayana. Is that all right? A simple man. And Ramana Maharshi said, yes, it's all right. It's all right. Yes. And if I'm devoted, if I bhakti, devotion to Lord Narayana, after death, will I go to Vaikuntha? Yes. I'll go to Vaikuntha. Yes, yes, you will go. And then in Vaikuntha, will I see Lord Narayana? Yes, you will see Lord Narayana. Oh, I'll see the Lord. Yes. Yes, you will see. He's so happy. Oh, I'll see Lord Narayana. And will Lord Narayana see me? Yes, he will see you. Oh, the Lord will look at me. Yes. And will the Lord Narayana say something to me? Yes, yes, he will say. What will he say? What will God say to me? The Lord will say to you, find out who am I. <laughs> this inquiry. This is the direct path to the realization of our identity. In Advaita Vedanta, the goal is to realize who we are and the answer, not to keep you in any uncertainty, the answer is, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I am the Absolute. If we would know the truth about ourselves, we would know the truth about God also. So this is a specific path. It is also known as Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge. One should... Um, I mean, th this is not directly related to the talk, but just to understand what we are talking about, it's good to understand what we are not talking about. So, uh, how is this path different from other paths? So, one way religion is understood is as faith, belief in God. So, that's the way religion is understood, mostly in this country, for example. So, Christianity, Islam, Judaism... There are paths of faith where you are asked to believe in God. And then the path starts for you. And it's a valid path. It's a true path. But it starts with faith, with belief in God. 
unless if one starts with the very question does god exist if you're starting out with um uh, uh, christopher hitchens or richard dawkins then the path of bhakti cannot be <laughs> begin for you so for a skeptical mind inquiring mind rational mind a bit difficult at first then comes another path why am i saying all this to distinguish the path of self inquiry from these paths then comes another path which is the path of yoga the path of yoga says not believe patanjali comes to you and says look here are the uh, techniques of raja yoga or patanjali yoga sit in this way breathe in this way focus your mind in this way withdraw from the external world in this way and concentrate you will get certain extraordinary mystical experiences which will prove to you the claims of religion that i am not the body and mind i am this witness consciousness yes you can actually experience it as vivekananda said if i have an immortal soul i must feel it if god exists i must see god the path of experience again we are not going to talk about that i'm just pointing it out to distinguish to get extraordinary mystical experiences and we find this in the lives of the great saints and mystics that they had a direct extraordinary experience of divinity so sri ramakrishna the vision of kali for example and different kinds of mystic absorption called samadhi have been nicely catalogued and classified in the yoga sutras so what is this this path it's not about belief it's about practicing certain things and getting certain extraordinary experiences experiences which we don't have yet but we will have if you practice often people confuse this path with the path of knowledge path of yoga and path of jnana are often confused because they are in some ways similar close together they are allies but the path of the, the problem with the path of bhakti you know is it can it skepticism if you listen to a few lectures by christopher hitchens and richard dawkins and sam harris then you will lose all faith in religion the problem with the path of yoga is first of all these experiences true you can experience it but they are extraordinarily difficult to get and they are rare and subtle and even if you get it your neuroscientists some of you may be neuro- uh, neurologists they will say that it's not it doesn't prove anything just a little tumor in your brain or something like that is happening that's why you're getting these experiences that doesn't prove that you are a bodiless soul or something like that it's open to criticism there is this third path now what we're going to talk about the path of self inquiry which is not a path of believing in something which is not even a path of looking for extraordinary experiences see if i tell you you can experience god you can see god like sri ramakrishna told narendra nath datta which made him swami vivekananda can i see god and sri ramakrishna says yes i have seen god and you too can see god so it's a very convincing argument very convincing uh, pull um, a call but the only thing is yes you can see god but what is what lies between you and that that vision of god it's a long arduous strenuous uh, process of discipline and and sadhana the path of self inquiry is different it does not demand that you believe in something nothing it does not in fact it's just the opposite you you must not believe you must question you have to inquire here it's like going to a class um say you're going to a physics class and the teacher is teaching you something and um says do you get it and if the student says no but i believe you you are a good good person i'm sure you're telling us the truth the teacher will be exasperated you are it's not supposed to be believed you're supposed to understand what i'm saying similarly in the path of self inquiry is a path of understanding and inquiry <clears throat> what about experience subtle point what thinking about the experiences that yoga talks about are extraordinary experiences so when sri ramakrishna has a vision of kali that's certainly an extraordinary experience and note that only he is having it all the people <clears throat> in the room around are not having it they are in awe of what's going on but they are not actually seeing what he is seeing so those are extraordinary experiences not available to everybody second what what uh, the path of self inquiry does is it takes up our available experiences what we all have right now and makes an inquiry into that self inquiry is an inquiry into our experience of the self right now 
who is not experiencing waking and dreaming and sleeping? All of us experience. Samadhi, some may and most may not. But waking, dreaming, deep sleep, everybody experiences. Then you can follow the path of self-inquiry. Who does, who does not have the experience of subject and object? I am the subject and I am experiencing objects. Who does not have this? This is the basic structure of all epistemology, of all experience. Everybody has it. Then you can follow the path of self-inquiry. So, Ramana Maharshi made it very simple. Somebody came and asked, because in Advaita Vedanta, when you enter the path, they will first hit you with a list of qualifications. More difficult than getting into Harvard University. <laughs> Sadhan Chatushtai Sampanno Pramata Adhikari We used to memorize when we were studying Vedanta. Pramata means the knower. The knower who is qualified by the fourfold qualifications is qualified for Vedanta. What are the fourfold qualifications? Viveka, a discernment between the eternal and the non-eternal. Vairagya, a dispassion for the non-eternal. Gone, everything is gone there. Everything is non-eternal. So Vairagya for everything. Yeah. Uh, so, then the third one. Shamadamadi Shat Sampati, sixfold treasures. Shama. Uh, the calmness of mind, dhamma, control of the senses, um, uparati, withdrawal from external, uh, too much external engagement, uh, samadhana, focus uh, on, on your Vedantic inquiry, then uh, titiksha, a spiritual toughness, come what may, I shall follow through on my spiritual quest without deviation, and shraddha, deep faith that what the scriptures and the texts are telling me is true, until I realize it, as a kind of working, working faith, and then finally, mumukshutvam, intense desire to be enlightened. When you look at these, this list, I am not qualified. I took so much trouble to come here, but you are telling me that I am not qualified. So this poor man, he comes to Raman Maharshi and uh, he asks, Maharshi, am I qualified for, uh, for self-inquiry? Who am I? Am I qualified for this? And Raman Maharshi said, did you say I? Where am I? I. <laughs> am I qualified? Did you say I? Yes. Then you are qualified. If you have an I, <laughs> then you can inquire into the I. Of course you are qualified. Everybody is qualified for self-inquiry. It is the most direct path and the highest of all paths. All right, I have advertised it enough. Now, time, time for me to deliver promised so many things that it's based on our experience, it's based on inquiry, it's a direct path, it's open to everybody. Let's see. And the, it's very attractive when you hear the promise. Promise is that it's immediate. Oh, compared to 30 years of meditation, immediate, very good. <laughs> Sign me up. It's effortless. You are Brahman already. Realizing that's all you need to do is realize that seems effortless. Effortless. Other paths seem to have so much effort involved in that. Effortless. Effortless and immediate. Wonderful. Sign me up. <laughs> this is the one for me. For, uh, but the pr problem lies in the fine print. If you read below. <laughs> All right. There are different methods of self-inquiry uh, in Advaita Vedanta. So who am I? Raman Maharshi would always uh, throw you back on this question. Find out who is asking now, Advaita Vedanta, the texts of Advaita Vedanta, they are all methods of self-inquiry. And um, there are different forms. One is well-known, the three states of the mind. People often say three states of consciousness, but that's not technically true. Because consciousness, according to Advaita Vedanta, has only one, is, it does not have states. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep are three states of the mind. Inquiry into our experience of waking, dreaming and deep sleep leads to the realization of, of uh, our true nature, that I am the Atman. That's one way. It's called avastha traya vichara, an inquiry, an analysis of the three states of waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Another method is pancha kosha vichara, the analysis, an inquiry into the five layers of the human personality, the physical layer, the vital layer, the mental layer, the layer of the intellect, and the layer of, so-called layer of bliss, pancha kosha. Um, and there is the one which I will talk about today. The drig drishya viveka, the seer and the seen. Each of these is a powerful method. All of them lead to the same answer. The same answer being, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman. So we will take up one method. Um, this method is based on a text, actually. All of these methods go back to the Upanishads. So this method is specifically based on a text called Drigdrishya Viveka. 
um, about written about it's it's attributed to Shankaracharya, but scholarship puts it at around 700 years ago. Vidyaranya Swami, who lived in the south of India and in Karnataka, um, it's a short text, Dhritvishya Viveka, and we will take up only the first verse. You see, the first verse itself is such a bombshell, uh, stunning. It leads you directly to enlightenment. The first verse itself. As we go through this. The process of Advaita Vedanta, the process of self-enquiry, has three stages. And we must keep these three stages in mind. First stage is listening, Shravana. Listening does not mean literally just listening. It means systematically studying, basically. So, Shravana. And there is a technical definition of Shravana also. Shravana, but literally it means listening. Second is what we have listened to, um, Mananam to consider that, to reason it out. Third is Nididhyasana, that means meditating. Assimilating what you have heard and you have reasoned out. So the first stage gives you the knowledge itself, the instruction itself. And that's very important, because after the whole um, satsang is over, what did he talk about? Some profound philosophy. No, what exactly? I have forgotten. I have to look it up. <laughs> then it will not work. What is the teaching? I should know. At least I should be able to say it in my own words. Traditional teachers made you memorize the verses. But I won't do that. But uh, at least at the end of it, in my own words, I should be able to summarize the basic idea. It's a very simple idea, actually. So that's the first stage. Do I know what he said? I said, the teacher said. Stage one, if you say, yes, I know. I can say what he said. And that I know, the text. Then what's the problem? I don't understand. There are so many questions. When you take up those questions and reason it out, that's second stage. At the end of this, when do you know the second stage is over? When is the first stage over? When you can say, I know what he said. I know what the book says. When is the second stage over, the stage of reasoning? When you say that, I not only know what was said, but I understand. I get it. I get it. But then if, what is the need for the third stage then? The stage of meditation. What happens at the second stage is, one complains, I get it, but it's a sort of intellectual understanding. It doesn't feel real. I still feel the same person. I don't feel that I am awareness or something like that. So the third stage is, what I have learned, what I have understood, now I stay with it. I meditate. Somebody used a nice word, marinate. You know, when you cook, after cooking is finished, you don't immediately take it off. You put a lid on it and let it simmer and let it absorb the spices and things like that. The result is better. Similarly, what I have heard and what I have understood, let me marinate in it. So there are processes of meditation. Even in this little book, Trigdrishya Viveka, there are six <laughs> techniques of Nijadhyasana, meditation at the end. All it does, it allows you to assimilate it, at the end of which you can now claim, not only have I heard, not only have I understood, but now I can say, honestly, it's true. It feels real to me. If it feels real to you, if it is true, then you are enlightened. So these are the three stages. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. I am putting it to you in, in um, everyday English. If you study it traditionally, they all have the specific definitions of what they mean, actually, what you are supposed to do. All right. With this in mind, we will go into the teaching. And at each stage, remember, what did he say? Do I understand? Is it real for me? What did he say? I expect everybody to tick that box. Then if you're alert enough and listen, everybody can tick that box. I know what he said. And did I get it? Most people should be able to say, okay, I got it. And the last one, a fortunate few, one of, a few of us can say, yes, it's real for me. I'm enlightened, done. I mean, <laughs> I haven't started yet. All right, now I'm starting. Self-inquiry, one method, from the, from the text Drik Drishya Viveka. The verse goes like this. Rupam Drishyam Lochanam Drik, Tad Drishyam Drik Tumanasam, Drishya Drip Divrittaya Sakshi, Drigeva Natu Drishyate. First verse. Forms are seen, the eye is the seer. The eyes are seen, the mind is the seer, the mind is seen, the witness is the seer, the witness never becomes the seen. That's the whole verse. What does it mean? Here I can use the 
board a little bit. So here we have the sear and the seam. Can you can you see? <laughs> <laughs> Here in the sea. These are just the English translations of the Sanskrit words drig and drishya. What is it, what are we trying to do? Remember, we are trying to find out who am I actually. And remember, we always feel that I am the experiencer. So we are trying to find out the real experiencer. And the method is the method of seer and seeing. When we go into this method, keep in mind one operating principle. The operating principle is this. <clears throat> the seer and the seeing are two different entities. They are ontologically, to use a philosophical term, ontologically two different entities. What does it, what does it mean? Here is something that we are seeing. And let's say in a very naive, simple way, the eyes are seeing and the pen is seen. Clearly the pen and the eyes are two different entities. So the seer, the seer and the seen are two different entities. I mean physically separate entities, ontologically separate beings. And it's, it stands to reason because the first one is the seer is the eyes and the scene are forms, forms, colors. The Sanskrit word rupam technically means color, but you can say form. Clearly, the two are different. In fact, the eyes can only see things which are different from them, physically separate from them. The only thing that your eyes cannot see here are the eyes themselves. You cannot see your own eyes. That's not right. I can see them every day when I look in the mirror. You're seeing a reflection of your eyes. You look at a selfie, you're seeing a picture of your eyes. But the eyes, the way the eyes are seeing this, the eyes cannot see themselves directly. It's impossible. So the eyes and what they see are different. Now the method of teaching is a gradual from the known to the unknown. What the verse does is, first tells you something very innocuous, very simple. You all get the feeling, yeah, yeah, we know that, go on, move ahead. But very soon you get, get into really deep waters. So from the known to the unknown. But any good teacher, they say this is the golden rule of teaching. From the known to the unknown, from the near to the far, from what is to what shall be. So, obvious eyes are different from what they see. Note another thing. The same eyes see many different things. The same eyes are seeing the white here, the yellow of your dress, the pink of the flowers, the so many colors, so many shapes, so many objects, people and chairs and um, the microphone and so many objects. Thousands of forms, colors, shapes and objects are seen by the same pair of eyes. Seer is not only different from the scene, seer is one and the scene are many. Second. Just keep it in mind. Note. Third. The things which you see are continuously changing. Just imagine what you saw outside when you came here. The freeway and the sights you saw there. The trees and the snow and the cars. Now you're in this room and this house, you're seeing different things. Very soon you'll be seeing very, many different things again. What you are seeing is continuously changing. Throughout our lives, what we are seeing is continuously changing. But what is not changing is the seer, relatively speaking. The seeing organ, the eyes are relatively unchanging, and but what they see are continuously changing. So third point, the seen are continuously changing and the seer is relatively at least unchanging. I made three points to be noted. First, most important, seer and seen are different. One, clearly, true. Second, the seer is one, the seen are many and varied. Third, the seer is relatively unchanging and the seen are continuously changing. Remember our process. I hear, think about it, do I get it? And finally, is it true? Have you heard? 
Do you get it? Yes. Yes. So kids would say, duh, they see. Yes. <laughs> Very American. This is, this is so <laughs> get on with it. This is so easy. Yeah, I get it. Then is it true? Does it feel real? That the scene scene is different from my eyes. Does it feel like a fact? Is it a fact? Yes, it's a fact, obviously. Get on with it. All right, I will. And just by the way, just not not just the eyes, ears also. The ears are seen is only like a metaphorical use. They hear sound, and the ears and the sound they hear are different. The ears are uh, the same ears hear different kinds of sounds, and the ears remaining unchanged. The sounds keep changing. Same with the nose and smells. Same with the tongue and the hundreds of different tastes we have. It keeps changing. Same t tongue and the different tastes, skin and touch. So all the sense organs, they are like the seer and whatever they experience, all the things that we experience in life is like the seen and they're different. And they are one and the many and uh, unchanging and changing. Okay, good. Now, deeper. The deeper next stage is Lochanamdri, uh, Rupam Drishyam, Lochanamdri. That is the first one. Second one is we go inwards. Why inwards? Because we are going to a journey to know ourselves. So we are in here somewhere. Inwards, but remember inwards into what? Not into the body. Because if you go into the body, what happens is, physically into the body, obviously you will get what? More body. You will get blood and flesh and bones. When I say inward, I know you understand, but it's good to make this clear. Inward means a closer, deeper look into our own personal experience. So an inner experience would be, is it too loud? Yeah. You can hear clear, clear. Yeah, it's, it's perfect. So inwards means into our own experience. Now consider the eyes themselves. The eyes themselves. Are you aware of your own eyes? Eyes are open. Are you aware of this? Yes. Blink my eyes. Are you aware that you blinked your eyes? Yes. I can see clearly. I'm aware of that. I, I cannot see clearly. I need uh, glasses and so on. So I am aware of my own eyes. The eyes themselves are seen. Now the eyes themselves become seen. I'm going deeper. And what sees the eyes? Here the word, use of the word sees is obviously okay. figurative. Yes, metaphorical, that experiences. What is aware of the eyes? The mind is aware of the eyes. With my own mind, I can consider, think about my eyes. Do I need to go to the doctor? And uh, what kind of glasses do I need? And so on and so forth. So the condition of my eyes is known by the mind. And the eyes are no longer now the seer. They have become the seen. <coughs> The mind and the eyes are different. Remember, seer and seen are different. Clearly the mind, whatever the mind is, but the eyes are different. The eyes are here and the mind is somewhere in there which is thinking about the eyes. The seer and the seen are different. The same mind, it gets inputs, a variety of inputs from not only the eyes, but also the ears and the skin and the nose and the tongue. All the sense organs with their hundreds of activities throughout the they, they pour their inputs into the same mind. One seer, seen are many. And the same mind, relatively unchanging, the seen are continuously changing. Whether what you are seeing with the, uh, the conditions of the eyes, conditions of the ears, nose, skin, the whole body is continuously changing and you are experiencing it relatively unchanging mind. At this point you may object, wait a minute, the mind is changing very fast. True. But the mind is changing into mind, thoughts into more thoughts, perceptions into more per perceptions. But the other changes are of various kinds, the changes going on in the eyes, in the ears, in the nose. So changes, many changes, continuously changing, the seer is relatively unchanging. Mind is different from the eyes, seer is different from the seen, and the seer is one, the seen are many, the seer is relatively unchanging, the seen are changing. The mind itself, let's go deeper. At this point, always ask three questions. 
Did I hear it? Yes. Hopefully. Yes. Do I get it? Do I understand it? Yes. yes. Still pretty simple. And is it a fact? Is it true? Is it real? Yeah, it's real. You don't seem convinced? Yes. It's, it's actually reporting a kind of phenomenological, psychological experience which we all have when we consider our own body and sense organs. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Always check with your experience. If you develop the habit of checking with your experience, stage one, what is the teaching? Stage two, do I get it? Stage three, is it real for me? If you keep checking like that, at one point you will say that I hear what you said but I don't get it. Then the question of reasoning and question and answer and thinking it out comes. At one point you will say that I got it but it doesn't feel real. It so seems kind of theoretical kind of abstract. That's when you need to stop and stay with you what you have understood until it feels, yes, it's real. It's true. Um, so this was the second stage. Let's go deeper. Drishya Dhivrittaya Sakshi. The mind becomes the seen and the seer. Let's just call the seer the witness. Why witness? Because it experiences the mind. I mean, it's just a name that you can give. Sakshi is just a name. What does this mean? The thoughts in our minds, ideas, memories, desires, feelings, um, all of this, are we aware of it or not? Yes, we are. I am happy. Do I know that I am happy? Of course. Who else knows that I am happy except me? So, a thought comes up in my mind, I want this. A thought comes up, I don't like that. Am I aware of it? Yes. I am aware of my own thoughts. What's going on in my own mind, I'm aware of it. If I'm aware of it, then the mind becomes the seeing, and there must be some seer. There must be some seer of this seeing. We just don't think in this way, but if there is something being seen, then there must be something seeing. And by our operating principle, the seer and the seen must be different. So the seer of the mind, which I am, is different from the mind. Just as the mind is different from the eyes, and the eyes are different from the forms, similarly this witness, Sakshi, must be different from the mind. Did you hear what I just said? Yes. Do I get it? No. Some are saying yes. Some are saying no. And a few brave souls might say, it's true, I've realized it. It's, if it's true for you, then it's done. <laughs> you have taken, it's still the first step, but still a very important step. In the uh, road to realization, enlightenment. Something very big is being said here. There is a witness of the mind. You are the witness of your own mind. And this witness, you the witness of your mind, must be different from your mind. Not only that, the mind has so many thoughts. So many thoughts, feelings, perceptions, memories, desires, all known to the same witness. You are the same witness um, of the variety of thoughts and feelings. Somebody said that the mind, typical mind, you know, mind you have 16,000 distinct thoughts every day. 16,000 thoughts. But don't, don't think that they're not particularly valuable. <laughs> Often they are repetitive. Often they are just... Uh, uh, the mind sort of mindlessly churning away and thoughts. But they are distinct. So 16,000 and you the witness, one. Same witness lights up 16,000. is a witness of 16,000 different thoughts, feelings, emotions, perceptions flooding the mind. And the mind changes very fast. Thoughts come and go. Just imagine this one day from the morning till now, how many times bored and excited and peaceful and annoyed and eager and uh, tired. How many times in one day, just from morning till now, how much the mind changes. Yet it's the same witness, unchanged witness, which witnessed the bored mind and the sleepy mind, which witnessed the excited mind and the awake mind, which witnessed the desiring mind and the satisfied mind, same unchanged witness. So, putting things together, the witness is different from the mind, 
the witness is one and the thoughts in the mind are many, the witness is unchanging and the mind is, is changing very fast. There's a story I like about this which I often tell at this point. Um, somebody went to a monk in the Himalayas and asked this question that, uh, you know, the Swami, he asked the Swami, Swami, I'm very unhappy, uh, I'm miserable. In Hindi, actually, it works very nicely. I'm miserable. And the monk, now you can say, if you have assimilated this, you can immediately, you don't need the Swami, come to me, I'll tell you the answer. Are you aware of your misery? Do you know your misery? Do you feel it? Of course. That's why I'm saying, I'm saying I'm miserable, because I feel miserable. I feel sad. I feel unhappy and anxious. I feel it. Of course I know these feelings. <coughs> if you know it, then your misery is seen and you are the seer and the seer and seen are different. You are the knower of your misery, therefore you cannot be miserable. <laughs> See, it's a very important insight. <laughs> In Hindi he said, Agar tum apne dukh ko jante ho, to tum dukhi nahi. If you are the knower of your dukkha, sorrow, then you cannot be dukhi though, the sorrow possessor. Because the seer and the seen are different. And it's true. If you think about it, it's an object. Just as this is an object different from your eyes, the flash of pain and misery and unhappiness in the mind is an object different from you, the experiencer of your mind. I repeat that. You, the witness, to whom the thoughts of your mind arise and disappear, like motes of dust in a beam of sunlight. Just to make it clear, you are not the motes of dust, you are the beam of sunlight. <laughs> the thoughts, feelings, emotions are like the motes of dust floating around. When we are kids, we learned Brownian motion. They are floating around in the, you can see in the morning, a beam of sunlight, little, tiny little dots of, they are like that, thoughts, feelings, emotions. The light is not involved with that. It just illumines all of that. Similarly, you, the awareness. Somebody questioned a monk once. And you are playing with words. There is a feeling of sorrow and there is a feeling of happiness. And the Swami said, which one are you? If you were miserable, then if you are the same person, you would If See, I am miserable. If you take it as an identity statement, then you should be miserable all the time. Because if you stop being miserable, then you are not the same person. I is equal to miserable. Then the miserable has gone. Then that I also must have changed. But I say, same I, miserable. Same I, happy. Then logically, misery and happiness are not stuck to you. They come and go. If it's not stuck to you, it cannot be any part of your identity. Then one um, person objected. You sound much more funny in Hindi, actually. He said, no, 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 you're playing with words. It's a fact to me that sometimes I'm miserable, sometimes I'm happy. Whatever your logic says, this is my experience. Sometimes I'm miserable, sometimes I'm happy. Kabhi dukhi, kabhi sukhi, in Hindi, he said. And the monk replied, ha, kabhi gadha, kabhi gau. <laughs> sometimes you're a donkey, sometimes you're a cow. <laughs> it's equal to saying that, why don't you see it? That these things come and go in the mind, you are the same witness of a changing mind. Already we are pretty deep. Notice that this gives you a tremendous freedom from the mind. <clears throat> if it's an object like this pen, like this piece of cloth, the things floating around in the mind are not you. People are so tormented by the mind. Why are they tormented by the mind? Because we hug the mind to ourselves so tightly. We've forgotten that we are different from the mind. There's this poet, um, very famous young poet, Sylvia Plath. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, reading about her, I think the Bell, what was the name of the fam famous book? Do you, does anybody remember? The Bell Jar, I think. She killed herself. One of the last poems she wrote, you know, it's so... Uh, she is sitting beneath a fruit tree, you know, and she is thinking about the things there, the prunes on the tree. Basically, she's thinking about her life. What could I be in life? Should I be an explorer? Should I be a mother? Should I be a poet, an author, famous for her work throughout the world? 
or raise a family with beautiful children or go out and be an explorer in Africa. And he says, I sit like this beneath the tree of life until the leaves, the, the fruits, they, they dry and fall off the branches and the leaves wither and curl up and die and nothing is left. So like opportunities in life, and they passed me by and it's gone. I was just reading that thinking, no wonder she killed herself. Very sensitive so, deeply sensitive so. But why? It tormented by the mind. But you are not the mind. You can have the most sensitive and beautiful mind. And you know, another story, the beautiful mind, the, math the mathematician at, at Princeton, Nash, yes. Tormented by the mind. It's very interesting. Uh, in the, there's a book and a movie also about it. And I like what I liked about it, it's something very interesting close to Vedanta. At the end of the movie, Somebody interviews Nash and says, do you still see those hallucinations? He says, yes. Are you seeing them now? Yes. And the interviewer gets nervous. Looks <laughs> <laughs> then how do you handle it? Because he has stopped taking medicines. Because in those days, uh, medicines were very poor, I mean, crude. Nowadays they are much more sophisticated. But he stopped taking. So he's seeing the hallucinations again. He says, I tell my mind that they are not real. Though you are seeing them, though you, they seem real to you, they are not real. So he has this, developed an ability to make a little gap between himself and what the mind is presenting to him. Vedanta requires this. We think of him as an odd case. According to Vedanta, we are all exactly in the same case. Living in a world of hallucinations and thinking they are real. And then being tormented by it. So, yes, witness of the mind. You are this witness. In Sanskrit, Sakshi. <coughs> it does not change. It is the nature of awareness. How do you know it's the nature of awareness? Because it, everything is revealed to you. You, the witness, light up the mind and the contents of the mind are revealed to you. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, identity, your personal story. Remember, the person that you think yourself to be is not in the witness, it's here. Your personal narrative, your story is in the mind, not in the witness. Witness is aware, is like light. And the witness lighting up the mind, through the mind, you light up your sensory system. Eyes, skin, taste, touch, all of that. And through the sensory system, you light up the world outside and experience a world. But all throughout, the seer is only one. It's not that the eyes are the seer or the mind is the seer. Actually, the seer really is the witness consciousness, this awareness, and everything else, the thoughts in the mind, seem objects. The sensory inputs, objects, and the things of the world are objects. They are things. They come and go in your light. You are unchanged. Notice immediately, problems of the physical body are here at this level. Problems of the mind are here at this level. You have got an objective approach to them. The person, this is the person. This is impersonal. In Vedanta we say that it's not, the person does not get freedom. You get freedom from the person. The individual being does not become suddenly free, a Brahmagyani. No, that's just a way of speaking. You are already free. This is already free. What is being said here is tremendous. Objects of the world, are they present here or not? Are they present here? Are things, are things there or not? Yes. Yeah. Your sense organs, are they present or not? Yeah. They are present. Yes. Because? Because you are seeing. Yeah. seeing. Mind, is it present or not? Yes. yes. If you can consider, is my mind present? Your mind is present, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you, the witness, this witness, awareness behind the mind, is it present or not? It is. It's only that you that one moment of hesitation you have saying that it's because we feel um, this sounds either rather new or I've heard this all earlier but it still sounds a little theoretical. Vedanta says, as much as this world is present, this witness is present right now. You are it. Tattvamasi. That you are at this moment also. It's directly present. In fact, more so than the world. That the world, the farms are there. How do you know? I see it. 
eyes are there. How do you know? I can feel it, blink it, I can look at the mirror. Because I'm seeing the forms, I know the eyes are there. Mind is there. How do you know? It is revealed to me in my awareness, thoughts, feelings and emotions. Then the witness is also there. How do you know? Because you know. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. That there is a pen. The Swami is standing there with a pen in his hand. How do you know? Is it true? Yes. How do you know? Epistemological question. Justify it. How do you know? You say, I see it. So, the rule for something being present is you see it. I see it, therefore, this it's a proof. I have justified that I can claim it is present. He is present, she is present, this object is present. Some people are absent. How do you know that? If they were present, I would see them. I do not see them, therefore, they are absent. So, that's the rule. How my eyes are used. Now, let me ask you. Are your eyes there? Yeah. yeah. How? Because the rule is, do you, you have to see it to say, say that they are there, but you don't see it. How do you know? Inference. Inference, mind sees it. Direct answer in Advaita Vedanta is just because you see those things, your eyes must be present. When there's a photograph, a group photo, you can see all those people. Is a photographer present or not? Yes. Not that there is a photographer is in the group, but because there is a photo, nowadays of course selfie you can take, but, <laughs> but because there is a photograph, the very fact of the photograph testifies to the photographer being present. Similarly, the very fact that you see these things testifies not only to the fact that these things are present, but more so to the fact that your eyes are present and open and functioning. The very fact that I see shows me that eyes are there, even though I cannot see my eyes directly. Hold on to that. The very fact that you experience what? Anything. Is the testi testimony to the fact that you are awareness. <clears throat> Unless I were awareness, I would not be having these first person experiences. The experience of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, speaking, desiring, remembering, forgetting. All of these are first person experiences. Direct experiences, what philosophers call qualia. I'm so glad that we're living at this time. This question is coming up in a big way in consciousness studies now. If you Google it, they call it the hard problem of consciousness. And there's something called the set of easy problems of consciousness. There's something called the hard problem of consciousness. Some of the top minds in the world today, at Harvard, at, at NYU, David Chalmers is there who coined the term hard problem of consciousness. How are we having first-person experiences? That's the question. And so there are a lot of discussion going on there. <coughs> so, I am the witness of all experiences. I am that unchanged awareness. Death, level of body. Disease, level of prana. I am the witness of the living body. I am the witness of the dying body. And I guarantee you, you will be the witness of the death also. You do not die. You do not die with the death of the body. You, do, you are not born with the birth of the body. You do not go away with the falling asleep of the mind. You are the witness of the mind in waking state. You are the witness of the mind in dreams. You are the witness of the mind resolved in the darkness of deep sleep. And you are the witness of the mind awaking from deep sleep again. <coughs> you are the witness, unchanged witness of the mind restless. You are the unchanged witness of the mind deep in calm meditation. Now just think about it. You the witness, when the mind was restless, isn't it that to you it appeared a restless mind? Whom did it appear to? You experienced the restless mind. Right? When the mind is deep and calm, sometimes in meditation it is calm, and sometimes in contemplation it is calm. Who noticed the calm mind? You. You the witness of the restless mind, you the witness of the calm mind, are you restless or calm? You are unchanging. You are calm, with, but not the calm which can be disturbed. The Bible, Jesus says, peace that passeth understanding. It is not just, just the peace of the mind. It's the peace that passeth understanding is something beyond the mind. 
in the Mandukya Upanishad, the witness consciousness is called Shantam. Shantam Shivam Chaturtham Manyante. So this seventh mantra of Mandukya Upanishad. The very nature of your real self is, it's not that it is peaceful. It is peace itself. Peace itself is your name. Shantam. It's a peace which cannot be disturbed. The mind can be disturbed. And the mind can be made peaceful. One more point. This witness, immediate temptation is, oh, the Swami is telling us to practice being the witness of the mind. Don't do that. Big problem. That's just the mind trying to be the witness. Remember, this witness has no beginning, no end. If it is there, it's there right now. Whether you know it or not, the witness is witness right now. Awareness is the witness right now. If you know it, good for you. If you don't know it, samsara. But it's still there. The mind can practice being a witness. It's a kind of meditation technique. But that kind of practicing being the witness has one characteristic. It begins and ends. When you try to do it, it's there. When you stop doing it, you again become involved. That's the mind playing at being the witness. It's never really the witness. It's a good practice. But that's not what Vedanta is talking about. And Uttarakhand one sadhu was teaching this, Rig Drishya Viveka, and he said, so, my dear monks, you know, in Hindi, Mahatma Lok, you feel that you are the Sakshi, the witness? Uh, you are aware of the mind? Ha, ah, the sadhu said, yes, yes. And then he says, you're going to fall into a very big pit. <laughs> you're going to fall into a very big pit. What is the pit? You feel that now I am the witness. Up, theek, everything is fine. That's the mind. The very mind which was... Disturbed earlier, now after Vedanta talks, feels, oh, now I am the witness. Very soon it will be disturbed again. <laughs> so, the witness, that man who went to the Swami and said, the Swami told him that you are not sorrowful, you are not miserable, you are the witness of the sorrow. That man came back to the Swami and he said, you are right. Ab mein bahut now I am very peaceful. You are right. I understood what you said. Now I am very peaceful. Immediately the Swami scolded him. No, you are not peaceful. You are the witness of the peace in your mind. Very important. The moment the mind calms down, we again become attached to it and we embrace it. This is very nice. The problem is you have embraced something that will change again. If you are a sadhaka of long standing, generally the mind will be calm. If you are not, the mind will change immediately under a few blows from the world. If you know that I am the unchanged witness of the changing mind, then you are safe. <clears throat> if you want to keep the mind in a particular state, then you are in trouble. The mind will change. Is it wrong to have a peaceful mind? Of course not. It's good to have a peaceful mind. Peaceful mind, sattvic mind. And the peaceful mind is good for spiritual practice. Of course it's good to have a spiritual, uh, peaceful mind. But remember, you are not even that peaceful mind. You are the witness of that peaceful mind. You are ever peaceful, beyond any possibility of being disturbed. One more point. The last quarter of this. We are in three quarters. First quarter, eyes are the seer, forms are seen. Second quarter, mind is the seer, the eyes are seen. Third quarter, witness is the seer, mind is seen. Now, immediately our tendency is, oh, this witness sounds cool. American memory. Witness sounds cool. How do I see this witness? I want to see this witness. It's very nice. You cannot. The fourth one says, Drigeva Natu Drishyate. The seer never becomes the seen. No. The witness never becomes the witness. Because if the witness itself becomes the seen, then who is the seer of that? Impossible. It's technically impossible. So I cannot see the witness. Then the whole thing is pointless. No, 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 it's not pointless. You can be or you are the witness. When Ramana Maharshi asks, you find out who am I, he is not asking for an answer. I found out who am I, let I write a paper on it. No. <laughs> if you really found out who are you, then you would be immediately one with it and that the problem is over. It's not something that you can actually express and write an essay on it. So, who am I leads to you knowing that I am not the body and mind. But you cannot objectively say and put it on a board like this that you are the witness. But actually, objectively, you cannot do that. 
you become it or you realize you always wear it. That's what you realize. Unchangingly. The whole process is one of pointing out what already exists. In Vedanta they say, you get what you already have. And you get rid of what was never there. Praptasya prapti nivrittasya nivritti. Praptasya prapti means what is already there, the witness that you get because you thought you didn't have it. And what was never there, the problems of samsara. Remember, they are there. The body has its problems. The mind has its own problems. But they are not your problems. You can deal with them just like the car may have its problem and you can take it to a mechanic and solve it. The same way, you can deal with the problems of the body and mind. But remember, they are not directly your problems. So the problems of samsara which were never yours are now removed. Nivrittasya nivritti. What is ever not there is removed. And what is always there, you get it. This, what kind of spirituality is this? This is not a journey in time and space. That um, I will go to some place that is more spiritual. So theistic religions promise after this life there will be heaven. There's a place called heaven. But here we are not saying this. This witness is right here. Wherever you go, there it is. Witness is ever present. All the time, everywhere. There's another kind of promise that after, you know, say after death you will see God. Notice the word after. It's a time word. Before, after. Not now, then. Not here, there. But Vedanta says it's not not here and there, it's not now and then, it's everywhere and all the time. The witness is right here, right now and all the time it's there. Then what kind of a journey, if it's not a journey in space, if it's not a journey from here to Vaikuntha, to heaven, or it's not a journey in time, from now to after death, post-mortem spirituality. If it's not like that, then what kind of uh, spirituality is this? What is being, what's going on here? This is a journey from... Ignorance to knowledge. From not knowing, not realizing, to knowing or realizing our true nature. We begin to understand what we always were. We just didn't know it. Sri Ramakrishna gives the example of a, a washerman who found a diamond. He didn't know it was a diamond. And in India they scrub the clothes. So he, he said it's good for scrubbing. So he started scrubbing the clothes. That's how he used it. Then one day he thought, it looks like a strange stone. Let me ask my friend, the vegetable seller. He's more wise than me. So he showed it to the vegetable seller. The vegetable seller said, this is a nice stone. I'll give you 10 rupees for it. And then luckily the washerman held on to it. He said, let me ask my friend, the jeweler, who is more wise. He goes to the jeweler and asks, what is this? Oh, this is the biggest diamond I've ever seen. I'll give you a million rupees for it. Um, and the washerman's, all his needs were removed. His poverty was removed. He always had the diamond. The diamond is this. We always have it. All our problems can be removed if we know it for what it is. But we are like that man used it for scrubbing clothes. We are using it for desiring, hating, being miserable. Same consciousness. Without awareness, you can't be miserable. <clears throat> I am in great anxiety. Do you feel it? No, I don't feel it. It's impossible. I am in great delight. Do you feel it? No, I don't feel it. If you don't feel it, how can you be in great delight? Awareness is necessary for all happiness and misery. So it's always there. But we color it with this samsara. And we say, I am miserable. I am unhappy. I am a small little um, creature of flesh and blood. I am fated to birth and death. No. You are the witness in your <coughs> life. All of this is happening. Okay. I'm almost done. This is half of Advaita Vedanta. The other half I just state and leave it at that. And we'll have a little bit of q and I think, so that we can talk a little bit. Remember, this is not non-duality. There's still duality here. Do you see? Here is one and here's the rest. <coughs> Multiplicity is still here. You are the witness and here is everything else. Everything else that appears to you in, in your awareness. So multiplicity is still there. Earlier, my identity stopped at this skin. I am up to this skin and everything outside this skin is not me. Now all that we have accomplished is we have driven it deeper inside. Even the skin and this body and flesh and blood are outside me. 
Even my thoughts are outside me. I am the separate witness. This is what we have accomplished. But this is not non-duality. This is the stage of um, the great philosophy of Sankhya. Prakriti Purusha Viveka. The distinction between nature and consciousness. And you might be amazed. Some of the latest theories which are being propounded for consciousness. Panpsychism. The consciousness is a fundamental reality of the universe. Almost exactly what Kapila was suggesting thousands of years ago. Prakriti and Purusha, nature and consciousness, two <coughs> principles. That's what we have said here so far. But one more point remains, the second part, where you get non-duality. Because Ramana's approach was non-duality, non Advaita. <coughs> Ask yourself now, what is the relationship between you, the witness consciousness, and all of this that you experience? What's the relationship between consciousness and matter? Consciousness and matter, what's the relationship? One approach, four approaches this day. Um, there are more, but let's say basically four approaches. One approach, matter creates consciousness. And that's the materialist, reductionist approach. Most of modern mainstream science is like that. That here is this material universe, and in that, there are these tiny material things called living bodies. And in some of the living bodies, there are extraordinarily sophisticated nervous systems and brains, all matter. And they somehow generate consciousness. The operative word is somehow. If you say how, we'll say somehow. No, no, tell me how. I have had this discussion. So they say, they say well, there is something called promissory materialism. What is promissory materialism? It will give you a materialistic interpretation of consciousness, but I'm promising it will happen 40 years later. <laughs> give us time. No, they mean it seriously. Many things we could not explain earlier, now we are able to explain. Powerful argument. Let me, I'll show you how to deal with these arguments. One of them who is a biologist and also a philosopher at uh, uh, City University in New York, uh, CUNY. He said, look, at one time, Life was not properly understood. And people used to say 100 years back, life will remain an eternal mystery, God's mystery. How much you study, you will not be able to understand life. But you know, now we understand the processes which constitute life, what you call life, the like umbrella term. The processes are understood down to the molecular level, almost, in many cases. So it just took time. Better technology, more research we have understood. Similarly, Swami, give us time, 40 years, we will understand consciousness in terms of brain processes only. None of your witness consciousness or anything like that. Only brain. Now, what is the defect in this? I'll tell you what. From a Vedantic perspective, this answer is wrong. There's a fundamental mistake in this answer already. Mistake is this. Anything that you experience is an object, right? That's what we are talking about. Life, is it experienced or not? It is. It's an object. On which side will it lie, see or seeing? <coughs> see, on this side, firmly. In Vedantic terms, it's the pranamaya kosha. It is something, it's an object. Object to what? To consciousness. You are aware of life. For example, an experiment. Breathe in and breathe out. Were you aware of the breathing in and the breathing out? You better be. The whole mindfulness industry depends on this. <laughs> You are aware of the breathing in and you are aware of the breathing out. But what Vedanta takes away from this is, notice, you are aware of the breathing in and you are aware of the breathing out. The breathing in and breathing out were not aware of you. What was your experience? I am aware of the breath. Is your experience that, that the breath is aware of you? Is the breath saying, hello, I am going into your nose now and then hello, I am coming out, tata? No. The breath is not aware of you. You are aware of the breath. This is a very simple way of putting it. When you can do it much more sophisticated in your labs and in your scientific experiments, when you are aware of the processes of life. Processes of life are not aware of you. Therefore, prana is in the objective realm. It's something seen. And when you, ex when you say, now we have understood life, all you have done is explain something at a higher order objective process in terms of lower order objective processes. That's entirely possible. Why won't you be able to do that? Vedanta has no objection to that. Vedanta never said you'll never be able to understand prana. Prana is objective. Prana is in the realm of prakriti, in the realm of nature. Of course you can understand. You can explain objective prana in terms of more fundamental objective processes. 
That's all right. But when you equate it with consciousness, which is on the other side of the equation, and you say, your claim is now, I'll be able to explain this in terms of this. No, no, no. You're making a category mistake. You're saying that I'll be able to deconstruct the subject into the object. No. The example you gave, you see, did you see the, uh, the example you gave is a wrong example. You gave an example of an object which you deconstructed into other simpler objects. Now you're saying, I will similarly, I will deconstruct the subject into the object. No. This distinction is very clear from Advaitic perspective. It's not clear from their perspective. Because they've already assumed that um, uh, consciousness is material. Somehow, they've assumed. Second, this is one, one answer. Second, consciousness and matter. What's the relationship? The opposite. Matter is produced by consciousness. You say, who says that? All theistic religions say. Don't all theistic religions say God created the universe? When you say God created the universe, if you ask them, is your God conscious or unconscious? Yeah, of course conscious. God is sentient. God is intelligent, aware. So consciousness created matter. That's the second approach. Third approach is neither created the other. Both are parallel. Who says this? Sankhya. The Sankhya philosophy, yoga philosophy, Patanjali. Consciousness and matter. Purusha and Prakriti are parallel realities. They are fundamental. One cannot be reduced to the other. They interact with each other. In fact, at present, David Chalmers and some others, the panpsychists, um, two or three of them are there. Of course, they are facing a lot of pushback, but they are claiming something like this, that consciousness is fundamental. Matter is also real, consciousness is also real, but they are not reducible to each other. The last one is the Advaitic approach, which I want to mention, is that not that these are separate realities, not that consciousness created matter or matter created consciousness. Not that these are separate realities parallel. No. All of matter is an appearance in consciousness. Now notice, we are giving up the first thing we started with. Seer and seen are different. Now we are saying they are not different. <coughs> now we are saying, all that you see is an appearance in you, the seer. All that we call matter and energy and time and space are appearances in consciousness. The universe is the dream of consciousness. Maya is the dream of Brahman. Being poetic, Brahman doesn't dream. So it's an appearance. All right, I'll, I'll stop here. If just say, just a minute. Till now it was going on nicely, but you just threw out a claim. You didn't prove it. How can you say this entire universe is an appearance in you? Let me give you one uh, argument to prove it. And stop. What is the argument? What is the claim? The claim is that the universe is not a separate reality apart from you, the experiencer. Matter, energy, time, space are not separate from consciousness. They are appearances in consciousness. They have no separate existence. How do you prove that? How do you prove two things are independent? Two things can I, two things you can claim to be independent if you can experience them separately, apart from each other. Though they appear to be together, <coughs> the pen and the cap, I'm claiming the cap and the cap of the pen and the pen are two separate realities. You say, prove it. The way to prove it is, I can separate it. I can show you the cap without the pen. I can show you the pen without the cap. Then you will say, oh, they are two. Though they may appear to go together, but they're actually two units <coughs> separate. And each can exist without the other. Then only you can claim that they are separate, independent units. Can you do the same for consciousness and its object? Can you do the same for consciousness and matter? You cannot. Can you experience matter or anything apart from consciousness? Never. To experience something, you need consciousness. It's not so easy. Just think about it. Whatever you have experienced in life, the very word experience has consciousness built into it. You might say it's a trick answer because consciousness is built into it. I have, I have this retired physicist in our ashram, Bill. He is 95 years old and he always has this doubt. His, uh, people told me, to, don't worry Swami, he's been asking this question before you, since before you were born. So. <laughs> Swami, you say everything appears in awareness, but suppose in this room we put that camera. He says this very example. Suppose we put that camera and it records the room. Now we all go out of the room. Nobody, no conscious being is in the room. 
and we come back again and look at the recording, the room will still be here. So the room existed apart from consciousness. Nobody saw it. Without our seeing it, the room existed. It's an old argument against idealism. But here is the Vedantic answer. I said, ah, well, the room, us, camera, the room apart from us, camera operating in the, uh, in the empty room, and we coming back into the room and checking the recording of the camera, all of this is happening in your consciousness. Should I repeat that? <laughs> all of this, this whole experiment which you did, where did it happen? I have proven things can exist apart from consciousness. Who has proven and where? I build in my awareness, I have proven it. Shankaracharya says, Yaevatasya nirakatta tasyevatmasa The one who denies this consciousness, it's the very self of that one who is denying it. You cannot deny it without, without you, you being aware. How can you deny it without, how can you deny awareness without being aware? This is the one thing which cannot be denied. I will not push my case further. <laughs> I say that speaker should should finish before the patience of the audience is finished. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me do a peace chant. Let me do a couple of piyani. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om. You can just ask her, raise your hand and ask a question. We will make it fast and sharp. Yes, at the back. If we are the witness, why is it so hard to be aware that we are the witness and you add it all the time? Yes. We are the witness all the time. Why is it so difficult to be aware that we are the witness all the time? Two answers. One, at a preliminary level and second, at a deeper level. First answer is, the reason we... Uh, it's difficult to aware, be aware of the witnesses. Notice, the way we are accustomed to being aware of anything is by objectifying it. So, when you say, I want to be aware of something, what do I want? It's something I should be able to see it, or hear it, or smell it. So, no, 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 I don't mean that. I should at least be able to think it. That's also an object. We are accustomed to, ob the only way we are accustomed to knowing, all throughout, is by making a thing an object. And this is, the fourth quarter of this verse says, it is not an object, it can never be objectified. It's right here. It's some closer to you than anything else. It is you. But you can't put it out here and see it as an object. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. To realize what you are and then drop that trying is enlightenment. Let me repeat that. To realize that I am this awareness and then drop that trying to objectify it is enlightenment. If you right now drop the trying to objectify it, then you, you drop the pursuit itself. But after understanding it, after getting clarity, then you drop this wrong approach of trying to objectify it. I want to see my awareness. The last quarter, what we, what we discovered, it's not possible. It's not possible. Second, the deeper answer is this. If you get it, it's magical. You are either enlightened or very close to enlightenment. This very question, notice, how can I be aware that I am awareness all the time? Who is asking this? Is awareness asking this or the mind is asking it? The mind is asking it. It's, why, why do I say, you know, you can be awareness? No. It's the mind which feels that after a good talk, after a good meditation, after when, when I am calm, I begin to understand this. Who begins to understand? The mind. And when I get involved in samsara in the world, I lose it completely. Who loses it? The mind. The mind which is understanding it and is centered in calmness, and the mind which has lost it and is muddled up in samsara, both are lit up by you, the same awareness, completely undisturbed. The objective, the direct answer to your question is this, the objective is not to remain aware that you are awareness all the time. No. 
the objective to is to realize that you are nothing other than awareness that you are your name is uh, surya so that you don't always think that do you ever ask the question how can i always remember that i am surya you don't ask that why is it because you are always thinking i am surya i am surya don't disturb me i might forget i am surya i am surya no you don't think that you are so confident that my surya identity is available to me at an instant's notice although that identity is artificial it was given to you by parents when you were a child our identity as awareness is absolutely natural unshakable it's always there all that you have to realize is this idea that i am not awareness that i need to know myself as awareness that idea should be erased be careful not directly then the whole spiritual life stops <laughs> i by realizing that i'm awareness <clears throat> then you drop the pursuit of trying to objectify it notice that it is the mind it's a trick played by the mind when the mind begins to realize that i am not the ultimate reality behind me there is awareness then the last battle of the mind to retain its importance is then i have a role you know i i have to remain aware of the you have to depend on me to remain aware of yourself as awareness without me you are nothing you tell the mind no you depend on me for your very illumination and existence didn't you hear what the swami said you are a dream in me the awareness you have no existence apart from me i don't depend upon you <coughs> that's the answer yes at the back afterwards the eye there is something separate from your regular practice of hinduism are they go hand in hand or is something separate well from advaita vedanta the path towards your first part was the path towards <coughs> see have you noticed this is very impersonal it does not insist that you have to believe in hinduism it does not even insist that you have to be religious sam harris who is no friend of religion very hostile critic of religion but he has written this book waking up he says these two paths advaita vedanta and madhyamaka buddhism he says we have to admit that there is a core of truth in it not that i subscribe to everything that hinduism says or buddhism says but there is a core of truth in it we have to admit it even some uh, very harsh critic who has absolutely has only scorn for religion now, i don't subscribe to what he says but notice if you are an honest intellectual sharp enough and honest enough you have to admit that there is something here you cannot easily overlook this so it's an impersonal thing it does not demand that you are hindu but notice the whole goal of hinduism in in vedanta advaita vedanta is to realize this so all the practices the the seva the meditation the bhajans the puja they are all built around this ultimately to re- lead you to that aham brahmasmi moment when you are enlightened so, so i often say the systems in hinduism because hinduism has many systems but they are all enlightenment systems that technologies for giving you enlightenment they are not so much belief systems notice the word used for religion in this country <coughs> faith and it seems very natural but hinduism buddhism jainism they are not faiths yoga patanjali yoga they are not faiths they are they are technologies for enlightenment yes there are faith based religions in hinduism also so basically vaishnavism shaktaism shaivism they are um, faith faith based religions but even there there is a component of enlightenment throughout indian history you will find sages and saints men and women who have actually claimed direct mystical experience of god so that experience component has always been there does that answer your question yes because it's not so directly embedded that you have to become a hindu or believe in certain things that's why i find it that people are curious so when i go to the universities people are interested But if i go there and say that this is my idea of god and you have to believe it they will shoo me out of the door they are not interested in that but they are interested in consciousness in self they are interested in that very interested in that more and more so yes swamiji um buddha was an enlightened person yes um I can but see he practiced very... compassion yes so compassion comes from the mind yes and according to what you're saying if the If you are aware of that awareness, mm. you sort of become inert. No, you everything. don't. No, you don't. You don't. You don't. What happens is, 
So the question is, does life go on? Of course it does. Whenever you have such questions, just look at persons you consider to be enlightened. So the enlightened person may not be directly involved in activities in the world like Bhagavan Ramana. But he's there as a blessing to everybody. See, we are, he's not directly involved in starting schools and colleges. But today, 21st century, sitting in the United States, we are gathered in his name. <coughs> so it's not that he has no effect on society. Trem tremendous effect. Or some are dynamic. There are many sages and saints who are directly involved. They do much more work than us. Vivekananda, for example. Tremendous activity. He's the one who brought all these Eastern religions to the West. 1893, World Parliament of Religions. The Vedanta Society is 125 years ago. He started them. He was giving a talk on Vedanta. What is Vedanta philosophy? At Harvard University, 1896. That building is still there. And Harvard University Philosophical um, Club, Philosophy Club of Harvard University published it as a booklet. Swami Vivekananda. And I found in their old records, uh, visit by a Hindu monk. 1896. And then he went back to India and started the whole Ramakrishna Sangha and all. So tremendous work is done. How? When you realize you are this, does your mind and your eyes and the forms in the world, do they disappear? They are still there. Activity goes on. Then you can actually work much better. When you are identified with one person, work is under a lot of threat. I'm getting old, I'm, I have, I'm lonely, I have so few resources, and one day I shall die. So much fear and uneasiness and anxiety is there about oneself and one's surroundings. Of course, love and compassion is also there for others, but it's a mixture. When you realize you are beyond fear, you are immortal, you are this consciousness which can never die. Then <coughs> let this one life, as long as this body lives, I don't want anything back from the world. Then you take the pos position of the giver. That I can only give to the world. The tremendous activity is possible at this level. Consciousness itself is there. See, notice, right now you are consciousness itself, according to this. Are you able to do, do your work? I certainly hope so, I am able to do it. After you realize that you are consciousness, why should you not be able to do your work? Still continue. Psychologically, you will be in a much better position. You will be at peace. You have no demands from the world, you are fulfilled. You have no fear from the world. You are immortal, what can hurt you? So... Then only the compassion of the Buddha comes. The compassion and enlightenment, they go together. Our motto in the Ramakrishna order is Atmano Mokshartham Jagatitayacha. Swami Vivekananda gave this motto. For your own enlightenment and for the welfare of the world. See, the two go together. Thank you. Yes. Swamiji, uh, I was reminded of a quote uh, from Ramana when you were talking about the lifting of ignorance and the revelation <coughs> of knowledge. He, he spoke about the difference between dhyana, meditation of the mind to make it calm, and jnana, which is realization of one's nature, in the following way. He said, dhyana is like coaxing a wild bull to calm down by using force. But jnana is like coaxing the same wild bull by waving a sheep of grass. Okay, it's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yes, it's actually easier to meditate when you think of yourself in this whole paradigm changes of who am I. Then after that, calming the mind is easier. That's the Upanishad way. Or, or last question. Last question. So, consciousness is witness. Yes. And everything else is appearances. Is appearances. There is only one consciousness. Yes. So that means all of us have the same consciousness. Or we are the same consciousness yes. in all. In all. Yes. So why are we going through this process of appearances? So all these are standard questions. When you begin to understand these questions, will start popping up. Why are we going through these appearances? Um, the straight answer would be because as consciousness, because you can. It's possible for you. There are many answers to this. But one interesting thing is, are we all one consciousness? How many consciousnesses are there? The first impression might be, there are many bodies, there are many minds. So behind each body and mind, there might be a separate consciousness. But I just said there's only one consciousness. In the Gita, Sri Krishna says, 13 chapter, Kshetra Gyam Chapi Vam Vidhi Sarva Kshetra Bharatan. 
know me alone, alone to be the consciousness, one consciousness in all these bodies and minds. Literally, the field and the knower of the field. We can easily understand now. Seen and seer. Field is the seen and the knower of the field. Kshetra and Kshetra again. Sanskrit. Knower of the field is the seer. How many fields are there? So many bodies and minds. How many knowers of the field? You might feel many. But Krishna says only one. And that one knower of the field in all the fields is the Vedantic conception of God. So that's why when you say, I am Brahman, I am one with God in that sense. Not I as a person. I as a person, I'm different from all persons. Okay. Now the question is, if I am this pure consciousness, why are we going through all of this? Big question. There are different answers. Let me rattle through a few favorite ones of mine. Standard answer, Nadvaita Vedanta will be Maya. Maya projects is your power which projects you, the consciousness, in all these forms. And makes you appear as an individual. What's your name? Monica. Monica. Who is now going through her individual path in life. All of us appear to be individuals which we are not. Jeevas, sentient beings who are evol evolving spiritually. Vivekananda said, reading a book, page after page, chapter after chapter, body after body is coming and going. We are not coming and going. The reader is not coming and going. We are reading the book of nature. That's one answer. See what appeals to you. I'm giving you different options. The second one is, um, the second question is, uh, the second approach I take is, have you seen the Matrix movie? <laughs> so it's a thing I came up with when I saw the Matrix movie. I, I, <laughs> there's a glitch in the Matrix. <laughs> the glitch is this. You are pure consciousness, but somehow, we don't know how, you don't know it. Not knowing it, not knowing your nature <clears throat> as awareness, what is presented to awareness, the object, you have identified with it. I don't know that I am this person. When I see myself in a mirror, I think I am that person. That mirror is my body and that face is my mind. I mean, that, that, that thing is me. I have nothing to do with it. It's a reflection in the mirror. So the mirror is provided by Maya and we are reflected ourselves in that mirror and now we are living as these little creatures. And the way out is spirituality. Vedanta, of course, but all paths. One answer. I can see you're not particularly convinced by it. <laughs> deep philosophical answer. Okay, before I go to the deep answer, a, a little easier one, which I, I these one, these are the ones I like answers. Um, the answer is this: when a little child looks up at the sky, the nature of the eyes is to see. And the nature of space is to remain unseen. Because we can see only a surface, right? That which cannot be seen and that which tries to see, when you, the two come in contact, what will happen? The result will be an error. You will see, but you will not see correctly. The child sees an inverted bowl, like a surface, like a blue bowl on, on, on the uh. The very nature of consciousness is to experience. But there is nothing apart from it to experience. So when it experiences itself, that which is not an object appears to be an object. That which is unchanging appears to be changing. That which is unlimited appears to be limited. That which is spiritual appears to be physical and mental. How am I doing? <laughs> so it's the very nature. Let me make it even more simple. This question can be put in another way. Why is there anything at all? If I am pure consciousness, non-objective, why are these objects there at all? Physical object, body, mind, all of these. Why are they there at all? Two options are possible. Either things can be there or they cannot be there. Or then they may not be there. Either something is there or nothing is there. Two options. Look at your experience. You have both. In your waking and dreaming, you have objects. In your deep sleep, you have nothing. Both are possible and both you are experiencing. In fact, I would ask the question, if nothing was there, why isn't something there? That I could have asked. Of course, nobody would be there to ask. <laughs> Notice, there are two possibilities. You are asked the question, why are we going through it? The option is, we need not go through it. That's what happens in your deep sleep. You don't go through it. And that's what happens in your waking. You go through it. Both options are available to you. 
or on the cosmic scale, Srishti Stiti Pralaya. Why is there anything? Because God created this universe. Need not have? Yes, God destroys this universe. There's nothing there. Both are possible. Man in philosophical language, manifest and unmanifest. Abhyakta, vyakta. These are the two states of prakriti. They are manifested as a multi multifarious universe or nothing else, just blank. Still no? Okay. My last try. Last but one. The last serious try. Um, Vivekananda says this, the question itself is wrong. Why? What did you ask? Why are we experiencing all this? Why are we going through these experiences, you ask? And the answer given by um, Advaita will be Maya, because Maya projects all of this. But you may ask, why Maya? Ultimately, Maya also is according to you, not the ultimate reality. Only this witness consciousness is the ultimate reality. Why is Maya projecting all of this, if you ask? Then the Vivekananda says, the question itself is wrong. It took me a long time to find out why. Because you can, like a little kid, obstinate kid, you can still ask, why is the question wrong? Who is asking the question? Uh, but you can ask. But still, I'm asking. So who are you? That might be there, but I'm asking the question. If you say question is wrong, I can still ask like an obstinate child, why is the question wrong? I'm asking the question. Why to explain why is the question wrong? The question is wrong because of this. When we ask why Maya, what is this word Maya? What does it stand for? Desha Kala Nimitta, they say. Time, space and causation. The infinite, so I'm going to put it this way. This universe is the wreckage of the infinite on the shores of time, space and causation. The unbroken oneness of the pure subject appears as this broken objectivity of the universe because of time, space and causation. Even Kant said something like this, Immanuel Kant, that we are perceiving that which cannot be known directly through the uh, categories of perception, time, space and causation. So, if you now ask, why Maya? What are you asking? You are asking why about time, space and causation. Time, space and causation. Causation <coughs> itself. What is causation? Cause and effect. It's an answer to the question why. Why is it wet? Because it rained. Why did it rain? Because there were clouds. Why are there clouds? Because of evaporation. Why is there evaporation? Because of sunlight. Cause and effect. So your question why you are asking for a cause. When you ask why are we experiencing, what would, I, what would satisfy you if I gave you a cause? But you cannot ask for a cause of causation. It's only when causation has started then cause and effect takes effect. Before Maya starts, you can't ask why. It's like asking, time is also within Maya. Suppose you ask what was there before time. The question is wrong because the moment you use the word before, you've already accepted time. Before and after are time words. If you ask, what is outside space? Question is wrong, because when you say outside and inside, you already accepted space. If you ask, why Maya? Question itself is wrong, because you already accepted Maya. Why is causation, cause and effect? So, therefore, the question itself is wrong. If you ask, why are we experiencing? Because you are asking a question about causation. You are asking for the cause of causation. Did this make more logical sense? A little more logical. Yeah. The last attempt, one of the Swamis in our uh, West Coast, uh, he said long ago, the same question. He said, on this side of enlightenment, we have the questions and no answers. On that side of enlightenment, they have the answer, no questions. <laughs> Notice, it never seemed to bother them, this question. This doesn't bother them. On that note, let us end. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you.